backward stochastic potential equations, uh, probabilities in finance, discrete potential theory, and quasi stationary distributions. He has written about 60 art articles about these topics and co authored three books. Uh, one uh, is about quasi stationary distributions, the other one is uh, about inverse of M matrices and ultrametric matrices, and the third one is a textbook on measure theory that I strongly recommend. Uh, he was a lecturer at the International Congress on Stochastic Process, Processes and Applications in Paris in 2007. And he was a member of the editorial committee of journals like Stochastic Process and Their Applications and ALEA. He's an associate member of the Chilean Academy of Sciences. And today he's going to talk uh, to us about one of his main research interests, which is uh, potential theory. Uh, so thank you, Jaime, and go ahead. Okay, Pablo, let me see if I can um, project. Project is an old word, actually. <laughs> uh, trust, okay. Sorry for this. Uh, where is my Zoom? I lost my Zoom. <laughs> Here it is, stop sharing. So it doesn't want to share this thing. Share. Come on. <laughs> and we, there's just a blank, yeah. a black screen. Yeah, it, let it, me. It, it worked fine it, uh, some minutes ago. So it should work now. Yeah, it should work, but you never know. Uh, Share, it's good, okay. So uh, thanks to the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk in this wonderful uh, Congress, the Mathematical Congress of America, of the Americas. Uh, and the talk is about potential theory, uh, some new results. And uh, let me see if this, let me thank also first my co-authors, uh, Servet Martinez, I think is connected, and Claude de la Cherie, which is also connected. And my old co-authors, Gerard Michon, Mauricio Duarte, recent, recent co-authors, Pierre Bandel, Sheldon Sang, and Pablo Darnell as well. <clears throat> so the talk is divided in two parts. One is uh, about finite potential matrices, uh, in the context of Markov chains. I will put a, a, a watch here just to control my time, okay? Uh, and the second part is uh, about new potentials uh, on the Brownian context. So it's a consequence of some results of matrices as well. And in the, in the middle uh, of the two parts, uh, we were going to have a, a, a short break to, to take some questions, okay? Uh, so uh, I, I was thinking about potential theory for several days and uh, I came out with this list. It's my own list about uh, big, big mathematicians in the field, and starting from Gauss, uh, Green, the, the, the French school, Meyer, Claude, Bracheri, Brelot, Choquet, and the Japanese school also. So this is the Western uh, uh, people working in potential theory, Martin, Kunit, et cetera. This is just for the for the young guys that to know some big names. Uh, in N matrix, we have discussed a lot with several people, starting from Fiat Lebarga, Navin Ostrowski, of course, we didn't discuss because it's an old, an old guy, but it's so important in the theory that I, I put that name also. Navin uh, Minkowski is uh, the M for N matrices comes from Minkowski, and big guys like Johnson, McDonald, etc. <clears throat> So uh, let me start uh, by saying, what is an M matrix? Well, an M matrix is a square matrix that has a particular structure. Uh, it has no negative numbers on the diagonal, negative numbers on, on the terms of diagonal terms, plus a condition. And the conditions were, there are, I don't know, 20 something equivalent conditions in the book by Johnson. But uh, the main one for us, for probabilists, is that the inverse is non-negative. And why is that so important? Uh, I, I will try to explain you in a minute. So the coefficients are non-negative. 
okay? Um, equivalently, you can show that M has a decomposition of the form a number times the density minus N, where N is non-negative and S is bigger than the spectrum of N. So, uh, so M is invertible and uh, you can compute the inverse of M in terms of the powers of N. Um, and this is equivalent, and that's, that's very important for probabilists, that there exists a diagonal matrix with non-negative, with positive numbers actually in the diagonal, such that N times D, uh, so I will try to see if my pen works here, M times D is row diagonally dominant. That means that the sum of the diagonal the, of, of the rows are non-negative which means that the, the diagonal terms are really dominating the, the matrix. But if you multiply by D minus one, which preserves these properties, then you will recognize that this is something that in probability we call the H transform. So it's a, it's a way of getting new generators from, from one. And it's exactly it's an H transform because the diagonal of D is an eigenvector of M. Uh, so uh, reducing further, if M is uh, an M matrix and is row diagonally dominant, you can decompose as uh, proportional, so K is a constant here, times I minus P. And I is the density and P is a substochastic matrix, which if you assume it is irreducible, since we want M to be invertible, then the chain associated to P uh, lose mass at some point I say. So there is a strict, row diagonal dominance in some row. In the, in the language of uh, probability theory of Markov chains, L equal minus M is the generator of a Markov chain, of a transient Markov chain. So from now on, I'm going to assume that this constant K is equal to one, K is, K is related to a time change. So in general, uh, M is the gen minus M is the generator of a continuous time Markov chain. When k is equal to one, you can assume that it's a Markov chain. So u is the inverse of m is the sum of the powers of p. So this is uh, exactly the formula of uh, the inverse of one minus x. Um, and uij has this, the following interpretation is this is the spectrum number of visits for the chain that started at point i to visit the site j. And that's exactly the potential, the, the interpretation of potential in Markov processes. The main question in linear algebra, a main question in this subject is when a non-negative matrix, its inverse is an M matrix. So it, its inverse has this special structure. Uh, so the question in, 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 in probability theory will be when a non-negative matrix is a potential matrix. Well, there's a famous work of Hunt, actually three papers in a row in the 50s, 57 to 58, where essentially uh, he studied this problem in, in full generality, actually. Um, he proved that uh, if you have an operator, a positive operator bounded, define it in general in a Banach space, but let's say in Z0 of a, of a set S. G is a potential, so G is the expected time spent by a Markov process around points on S, if and only if there are two main properties. One is the maximum principle, which I'm going to explain in a minute. And the other one is the density of the image of C0 under G, which one tends to overlook, but uh, is quite important. So what is this maximum principle? Well, the maximum principle is related to many other maximum principles one knows from, I don't know, complex variables or uh, when you study a harmonic functions or associated to Laplacian, et cetera. But here is we're in the other side of the road. So actually G is like minus the inverse of the Laplacian. So the maximum principle is translated in this form for, uh, for potentials. So it says that if you know that G of F at point X is less or equal to one on those points where F is non-negative, so if you have a bound for the image of G of F on, on, the, on the positive part of F, then G of F is bounded by one everywhere. 
So the maximum of g of f, g of f is a function, the maximum is attained on the set where f is not negative, okay? With that at the hand, you can construct something that is called the resolvent, okay? So it's a one parameter family of uh, bounded operators. And for p small enough, you can actually uh, compute a, a, a series, a convergence series, and, and prove that uh, this, uh, this family satisfies what is called the resolvent equation, which here is simply that G minus UP is equal to P times UPG. Okay, so this is a commutation formula for this semi-group, for this, uh, sorry, for this resolvent. The maximum principle is used in two crucial uh, parts of, this, of the proof. One is to prove that UP is actually positive, and the other one is a bound on the norm of UP. So P times UP, has a norm bounded by one. But this gives you the result in a small interval. But then you can apply again the, this idea of, uh, of a maximum principle for UP, which also satisfies the maximum principle. And so you extend this result in a little bit. And since the norm of UP is decaying like one over P, then you have the full result on R plus. And the resolvent equation is simply that. Uh, is a, again a commutation property between these uh, operators. And if you differentiate with respect to P, this equality, you will get that the derivatives of, of this function as a function of P or F non-negative fix and X fix also is uh, completely monotone. That means that change signs as you continue differentiating. So there is a famous theorem by Bernstein that then UP is the Laplace transform of something. And that something is a finite positive measure. Well, uh, so far we haven't used the density and the famous density of uh, the image of C0. And, and here it comes. Uh, actually, you need a little less. You, you need to have enough supermedian functions. Uh, I, I won't go into details what is a supermedian function, but essentially in the language of uh, um, the stochastic process is, is a super martingale. So uh, using that, you can somehow integrate by parts and prove that actually mu has a density. Uh, that, that, that density can be written as a, again, as a measure. So lambda again is a positive measure, finite positive measure. And, and then you can prove that these measures, because they agree somehow, in, in a good fashion. And so they define a semi-group. And so this is the way you construct a semi-group. It's a long way to construct a semi-group from a, from a potential. You, you, you construct the resolvent and then you invert a Laplace transform and then you get, you get the semi-group. And GF is actually the integral of, of the semi-group on time, okay? And the good conditions, this, uh, this operator G has a, a kernel kernel uh, indexed by x and y, and gxy, little xg here, uh, is interpreted as, as the amount of time the, the, the process, the underlying process, spends around point y starting from x, okay? So let's, let's return to matrices. So the main question again, when a non-negative matrix is a potential? Well, you can use the Hund's theorem to prove that actually, it has to satisfy the maximum principle, which for matrix is, is read as, as, as this, in the same way. So the vector ux has a maximum where x is non-negative. But one year before the, the big theorem of Hund, Chokian Denis gave a beautiful, wonderful paper about matrices. And they prove that actually u is a potential so U satisfies this maximum principle if and only if the inverse of U is an M matrix row diagonally dominant. So in a way, in 56, like 60 something years ago, Chokian Denis solved that problem for linear algebra, but did really solve the problem. Well, for people working in linear algebra, they, they wanted, and they really want now still, to have classes of matrices for which you can say that in the language of probability, they satisfy this maximum principle. 
So to, to, to check that a particular matrix satisfies the maximum principle is hard. Sometimes it's much easier to invert the matrix. But if you have a, I don't know, a matrix that defined by a structure, then it's, uh, you cannot invert the matrix. Uh, you, you can use maple or whatever you want for a small size matrices, but if you have a hundred by hundred matrix, that's impossible. So they would like to have matrices defined by simple structures. And we did it, that uh, a long time ago with Servet and Gerard Michon in 94, when we proved that uh, an ultrametric matrix, non-singular, is always a potential. And what is an ultrametric matrix? An ultrametric matrix is a symmetric matrix that satisfies this uh, beautiful inequality, uij is bigger or equal to the minimum uik and ukj. And we were working on, on, on ultrametric matrices and uh, operators uh, long before that, uh, uh, studying some commutations formulas for, for Markov processes. So uh, if you say, why is called an ultrametric matrix, this thing, uh, and you say, well, because uh, if I remember uh, an ultrametric distance satisfies the opposite inequality, but actually you have to think about you as one over an ultrametric distance. So an ultrametric distance satisfies the similar inequality says that the distance between I and J is less or equal to the maximum of the distance. So it's a strong uh, triangular inequality actually. And the way we proved that uh, was uh, using a very specific uh, spectral decomposition of ultrametric operators, which are, can be written as stochastic integrals in terms of uh, a filtration. And lambda t here are not fixed numbers, like one is custom in, in uh, spectral decompositions, is actually a process, an adaptive process and non-negative. And this has some extensions uh, in 98, who proved it that the, the continuous version of that sum is, also, is always a potential, uh, assuming that AT is increasing and predictable, plus uh, uh, another technical uh, point. And we did uh, in 2000 an extension of, of ultrametric matrices. And by now, probably, this, has, this is the largest subclass of potential that are simply in quotation marks described in terms of filtrations. Okay, so this is probably the largest class of ultra of potential matrices that one uh, understands quite well. <clears throat> what they what they are important? What ultrametric matrices are important? So let me give a, a, a little detour from the main topic of this uh, talk today by uh, telling you some facts we know in, in a series of papers uh, we have done with Claude and Servet. Um, well, when is non singular? An ultrametric is matrix is non-singular if all the rows are different. This is this is fantastic for a first year a college student to prove that something is non-singular just by looking at the matrix and saying, well, all the rows are different, so the the matrix is non-singular. And how they appear? What are the Markov chains associated to this ultrametric matrix? Well, in general, they are associated to random walks and trees. But, so here, uh, uh, the class two uh, is quite general in the sense that you have a, a tree, a finite tree, of course, and you take a, a symmetric superstochastic matrix supporting on that tree. So that represents a random walk on the tree, which I'm going to assume that is uh, conservative except at one node that we call the root. So the potential of that uh, random work is always ultrametric. So you have a, a, a potential that is losing mass at one point, then the, the, the potential is ultrametric. But in, in general, ultrametric matrices appear as a restrictions of this uh, very special class of ultrametric matrices. And we proved that if U is ultrametric, so it's a potential of some random work, then you can extend the space. You can in, embed this your space in a larger space, which is a tree, and then your ultrametric matrix is the restriction of this potential. So potentials are have very few, uh, say, algebraic properties. So 
The sum of two potentials is not a potential. The, the standard product of matrices or composition of operators is not a potential. And if you want to have some ideas and to have a, a, a hand on, on, on potentials, we would like to develop some uh, properties, uh, study some properties that are uh, that live in bearing this uh, class of potentials. And one of them is that of restrictions. So if you have a Markov chain living in a finite space, say, and the potential of that matrix induces subpotentials in subsets by inducing a, a Markov chain on, on that subset. So you just record the, the path, the, part, the portion of the path that is passing through this subset J, okay? So this is one important uh, property about potentials. The last word about uh, ultrametricity that I want to say today is that in general, if you have a, a random walk on a tree, which is not necessarily symmetric, you can uh, explain it in, in basic blocks using ultrametric matrices. So how come? Well, uh, except for a diagonal uh, change, the, 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 the random walk can be assumed to be symmetric. This is, this is nice. So every random walk on a tree can be symmetrized in a way. And then there is a finite number of ultrametric matrices such that this potential is the product of these ultrametric potentials. Product, not in the sense, in the standard sense of matrices, but in the Hadamard sense of matrices, which will be important for the second part of the talk. What is, the, what is the, an example? So here you have a finite tree, so points one, two, four, and three is where this matrix is losing mass. So there are some points where the, the, the random work is losing mass because we want to be transient. And the extremal points here are one, two, and three. Okay, so point four is in the convex, the convex combination of one and two, okay? looking at geodesics in the tree. And so the potential of this random walk, whatever it is, is the product of three ultrametric matrices. So ultrametric matrices are the basic blocks of to understand uh, random walks on trees. And what is the Hadamard product? Well, the Hadamard product, which is a kind of important when studying, for example, the spectral properties of matrices, is just the component-wise product between matrices. So it's quite simple. Uh, uh, if you if you use the standard uh, matrix multiplication, it's like composing <clears throat> operators. If you use the Hadamard product, it's like multiplying the kernels, and that's that's the next part of 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 the of the talk. Okay, so let me finish it by saying that uh, recalling that there are very few properties that live in variant the Hadamard. The, the class of potentials. Uh, if you take two potentials, say at random, and you multiply in the sense of Hadamard, they are not, this is not going to be a, a, a potential. But we proved in 2009 that any power bigger than or equal to one of a potential is again a potential. And that has important implications in, uh, in even in the Browning case. So we also proved that the exponential in the sense of Hadamard, that means to take the exponential of every coefficient is again a potential. So the main question, and I will say a, a few words why this question is important, uh, for which functions f, f of u in the sense of Hadamard. So you, you take a matrix, you, you take the functions of every component is again a potential. Why is that important? Well, uh, one is custom to uh, model a uh, uh, Markov process by saying, okay, this is the local behavior of the process. You, you define the generator or you give the transition properties for a small time. This is one way to, to, to create new uh, Markov processes and it's nice to model uh, real situations. But sometimes you cannot measure that. Sometimes you cannot have uh, access to measure the, the finite dimensional transitions or the small time transitions. But you have access to measure uh, some macroscopic, uh, some macroscopic uh, um, 
variables over this uh, process. For example, in electrical networks, you can measure the voltage, but you cannot measure the resistances. So actually, you can, in some situations, you can measure the potential. And so how we model a potential, how we put a parametric family in a potential that we, after we want to estimate, to give a, to give a, a, an idea of what is the Markov process, the underlying Markov process. So if we have enough invariant functions or, or properties about potential, we can start modeling potentials instead of uh, modeling uh, the local behavior of the, of the process, okay? But this is a change in, in the, the point of view of, of modeling. So modeling the macroscopic way instead of the microscopic way. I think uh, we can make a break to, to take some questions if the audience wants for some minutes. Paul is your turn. Is there any question for this part? Jaime, is, is there any way to, to extend this, uh, all these things uh, beyond the trees or, or, or on the other hand, I mean, any like ultrametric matrix is associated somehow to a, to a random group walking a tree? Yeah, um, yeah, the ultrametric matrices are associated to, in a profound way to random walks on trees. Uh, um, and vice versa, every random walk on a tree can be seen as a, as a comp some sort of composition of ultrametric matrices. But there is one case, the linear tree. So in the linear tree, so you have a, a random walk on, on a line, so for example, birth and death, uh, that will give rise to, as I will say, any any uh, diffusion in, in one dimension. So any diffusion in one dimension is essentially, its potential is essentially ultrametric or a composition of ultrametric type of potentials. Uh, but beyond trees, uh, no, ultrametric, ultrametricity is, is intimately related to trees. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I guess we can go to the second part. If okay, have... let's let's go to the second round. <laughs> so uh, after we proved that theorem in 2009, that uh, that the powers in the sense of Hadamard of any potential is again a potential, we were looking for the same theorem in the context of green potentials for, for example, for Brownian motion. And there was a, um, an abstraction to prove that theorem. And the main abstraction was the maximum principle that I will try to explain uh, during the second part. So this is a theorem we just proved uh, last year and it was published this year with uh, Claude Ma Mauricio Duarte, Cervet Martinez and Pierre Vandel. And let me say a, a little word about Pierre Vandel here. Uh, he's a very young, bright mathematician and I'm very, uh, how would you say that in, in, in English? And um, um, France is, is, is really rich. But Pierre Vandel, which is a, a, a wonderful mathematician, is working in a high school. He decided to work as a teacher in a high school. This is the, the, rich, the richness of the, math, of the French mathematics. So you have a wonderful mathematician working in a high school. So what is the theorem? <clears throat> Well, if you take an open regular set in RD, and D is bigger or equal to three, because we want to, to be the, the, the Brownian motion to be transient. And you take a beta, any, any number between one and this critical uh, exponent, D over D minus two. Uh, G, G of theta is the green function associated to Brownian motion. So it's the it's 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 time Brownian motion spends around points in this uh, open regular cell set until is killed in the boundary. And you consider the, the Hadamard power of that potential. So the new, the new uh, operator is just to take the, the Green's function to power beta, okay? So this is a very natural way to introduce new uh, generators, the new potentials. And so is that a potential of a failure process? We proved that in the case of matrices. 
but uh, here there are there are a lot of problems with uh, with the with main uh, properties about the uh, the maximum principle. We actually proved that the, there is a process with cut like paths, of course, in the compactification of this open set. Um, let, let me say some few words about uh, the full space RD. So theta is RD, the green function is well known, is, is proportional to one over X minus Y to power D minus two. And here I will, I will say a few, uh, some, some comments here. So, so in in d in d equal three, you have that the, your potential is a constant times one over norm of x minus y. Okay, so it's one over a distance. So this is a, the main potential in a, in dimension three, and for ultrametric matrices we say that. And a potential was one over an ultrametric distance. So this is the only two known cases for us at this that uh, a distance induces a potential. Okay. So <clears throat> if you take the, the beta power of that, you're just changing the, the, the power, the, the way this potential decays. So since beta is bigger than one, you have a, a big singularity in the in the diagonal and in the the, the potential goes away uh, much faster. Well, you can parameterize this thing in a different way. If beta times d minus two is something that lives between d minus two and d. So it can be written as d minus alpha for alpha between zero and two. And these potentials were, are very well known. They are called risk potentials. And risk proved that they are potentials a long time ago, I think in, in the forties last century. Uh, and so the theorem is true for the whole space. And the main problem is to prove that it's true also for, for uh, other open sets. Uh, and what is intuition here? Uh, and let me explain you what, what happens when D equals three. So we're in R three and beta is equal to two. So we're considered the square of the standard ring kernel. And, and so you have this x minus y to power two. And the potential, and this is a potential that, that was actually proved by Ries. Uh, and it is well known now that this potential is the potential of a subordinated Brownian motion. So you take a W is a three dimensional Brownian motion. You get eta uh, one half stable process, which is an increasing uh, process independent of the realm of motion and you compose that. So you, 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 do, you do a random time change in your Brownian path and you will get, it's quite simple to, to compute here that the, this expectation is actually give you the right answer. Okay. Uh, what is nice here is that the, in, in the full space, this, this potential is, is uh, translation invariant and the, you can use a Fourier analysis to prove that actually it's a potential. So uh, Ries did that uh, a long time ago. And let me show you if, if this thing works, I don't know. Let me show you uh, some uh, simulations. <clears throat> so I'm taking somehow risk here. I uh, will share in a different way the screen. So I have it here. So you, can you see the simulation there? Okay, uh, so here uh, I'm, I'm showing a, a simulation of this uh, subordinated uh, Brownian motion. So on the right in figure two, you, you can see a blue curve, which is a standard Brownian motion. You, you can see some rod, uh, red dots there, which is the new process, the subordinated one. And then I have done two projections on the floor or in the wall just to, to have a, a better look at, at the trajectory. And how you create this subordinator? Well, on the left on figure one, you have an extra Brownian motion independent on everything. 
and you study the passage times of these problems. So the time it takes to cross different barriers. And so in figure three, you have this uh, subordinator uh, is somehow flat. So it's increasing, actually uh, it's increasing in every, every single time. And um, <clears throat> with that new time change, you compose with this blue one and then you get the red, the red ones. So let me see if this thing works for a new simulation. Uh, simulation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it does not work, but this is bad lab actually. <laughs> Let me see. Well, nothing work. Okay. <clears throat> As you can see, uh, this simulation is run in, in, in the time units of the red uh, process, okay? So when, when you have a big jump here, for example, then you are looking at a, a far away uh, path in, in the blue one, in the, in the Brownian motion path. So uh, if you, maybe you didn't notice, but let me see if, if it is run one more time. So the red, the red uh, process, which is the, the process associated to the, this new uh, potential, tends to stay a little longer than Brownian motion around the initial point, and then decide to jump and stay a little longer and, and so on. This is why, I guess, this is not a full explanation, why this, uh, this uh, new process has a, a bigger uh, uh, singularity on the diagram for the, the green function. Okay, so I will stop that and return if, if I can. To okay. Uh, so formally, this new <clears throat> kernel, the square of the green kernel in R3, is one over the norm of x minus y to power two, which is exactly the green kernel in R4. So the green kernel, the standard green kernel in, in four dimension is one of the norm square. So these two things agree, one in R3 and one in R4. So the, the time this, this subordinated Brownian motion spends around points <clears throat> is like the time expended by a four dimensional Brownian motion around the point Y coordinate zero. Um, so far, I, I have no ex, no pathwise explanation of this. Uh, it seems that Abelio Sepulveda, a, a young, bright young probabilist, Chilean probabilist, have some explanation that I cannot fully understand. So, if if you have a question about that, you should ask uh, Abelio instead of myself. So. Uh, let me give you an idea of the proof in the case of RD, which is already known, but we are going to take a different path. So our path is the following. We, we try to approximate Brownian motion by uh, random walk. So this passed the, the problem to matrices. So instead of having a continuous uh, potential, we have a matrix actually. You compute the power of that matrix. We know that that's a potential and we try to take limits. And we will like to have that, that this continuous uh, operator in, in continuous space satisfies the maximum principle, which is the main problem to prove that it's a potential, that there is a Markov process associated to that. And there are two things that one overlook from time to time. One is that C0 plays a fundamental role in the proof of Hunt and the density of the image of C0 as well. <clears throat> so I will comment on the problems we, we encounter in this part. But okay, let's take a, a, a random walk, <clears throat> a normalized random walk that is converging to Brownian motion. Uh, this random walk 
uh, or actually the Green's function associated with standard random walk, the unnormalized random walk is quite well known. It's not explicit, but at least there's a good relation with the Green's function for brown motion. So they're equal except for a minor correction uh, at infinity, okay? So that gives you a good uh, rate of convergence of, of the approximations. And so you define the approximate uh, potential, Gn, by, by this formula here. And it's power beta, which is essentially to change that matrix that appears here, uh, that is uh, defined by the Green's function associated with random work to power beta, okay? So that's, that's exactly what we're doing. You take a kernel and you, multi you compute the power of that kernel. And uh, you have enough control to prove that this actually converges to this kernel, to this uh, green, uh, to this uh, potential function G. <clears throat> uh, okay, that's, that's good. So your approximation works quite well. And F here, I'm assuming that F is compactly spot, okay? To avoid any problems. Uh, but what about the maximum principle? Well, if you try to use the maximum principle for the approximants, then you are in trouble because the maximum principle recall that uh, requires that if G beta of F is less or equal to one on the set of F is non negative, then you have to prove that G beta of F is less or equal to one, okay? But this, this does not pass quite well through the approximants. Because in the approximants, you have to discretize also the function. So knowing that the function GF, G beta of F is less or equal to one on the positive part of F, that positive part can be quite complicated. So how you approximate the function in order to preserve that property? And that was the main uh, uh, bottleneck we had to prove the theorem for many years until we came out with a, a new idea uh, one year ago or so. So we have a new way of proving that a matrix, a symmetric matrix, or a little more general than symmetric, but let's say symmetric matrix is a potential just in terms of inner products. So we proved that a uh, uh, symmetric matrix is a potential if and only if for every X, the inner product between UX minus one positive part. So this is highly nonlinear. So it's not easy to, to, to show that a particular matrix satisfies this. So we're not improving that part, but we're improving in the way that instead of having a point-wise inequality, we have a an inequality in terms of inner products that are more stable under limits. And the, the, way, the, the, the way it was proved that in, in one direction is simple. If U satisfies this, then assuming that UX is bounded by one on the, on the points I where X is not negative, then this inner product reduces to the negative part of X. But we're assuming that it's positive, and on the other side is, is negative, of course, because you are, you are doing an inner probe between something that is non negative and x minus is negative. <clears throat> so the whole thing is zero. And if it's zero, then whenever xi is negative, this quantity has to be zero. So u of x is bounded by one. Okay? In the other direction, it's a little more complicated, but I have no time to. You are mute, uh, Jaime. For some reason, you are mute. Okay. Uh, let me repeat what I said. Uh, uh, so, um, since you have enough control on the, uh, on the convergence of, of this approximants, you have this property that the inner products converge. So you have, this is non-negative. 
So the limit satisfies the same property. But uh, as we have seen for matrices, the fact that this inner product is positive implies the maximum principle. So in this way, you have proved the maximum principle. Instead of having a point-wise or uniform convergence, which is hard to prove, you just need to prove that inner products converge. And uh, just to uh, give some compliments, so let, let me go back a little bit. <clears throat> so this is gn of beta. gn of beta is just the, uh, gen the operator induced by the, the beta power of this green uh, kernel for the random walk. And so how you prove that actually gn of beta satisfies the maximum principle because it's not clear, it's an infinite matrix. So we have done it for finite matrix. So here is the, 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 the fact that F is compactly supported plays a role because then this sum reduces to studying the problem in a big box that contains the support of F. And here I'm using the, the mesh that, uh, given by, by the notebook is the zeta D. So this mesh is zeta D, zeta DN actually. And so you have uh, the random walk live is in, 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 in the full space, but if you induce it over this box, then the potential is just the restriction. And so you have the right formula. So instead of having the, the potential for the, the full random walk, you just need the potential of the induced random walk. But take a notice that the induced random walk is not anymore a, run, a nearest neighbor random walk because this, this is true when, whenever you are inside the box, but on the boundary, this point is connected to any other point on the boundary, okay? This is the inducive Markov process, okay? But it's still symmetric. And so you can apply our, our theorem about uh, potential matrices. And so this, this is a, a, a symmetric potential. So it satisfies this inequality. And also the beta power of that is also about a symmetric potential that we have proved in 2009. So you can apply this result for the power and, and so you are done. This means you are done. This means that this is not negative. So the limit is not negative. And so the beta satisfies the, the maximum principle. Okay. So we thought we, we, we have proved this here. But now, now the the, the little nuances came and uh, they, they, they took us quite long to solve the whole thing. So there, there are some problems on RD. And the main problem is that C0 is not the, a good space in RD because uh, at least for this operator, due to integrability properties, a C0 function is not integrable with respect to this kernel. So G, G beta of F is not well defined on C0. And CK is a bad space. So what, what we can do? Well, let, let me say, let, let's, let's go back to bounded regular open sets. In that case, C0 is a good space. Uh, G beta is well defined. You, you prove that satisfies the, the complete maximum principle there by approximating with a compactly support functions, there's no problem there. And finally, you are facing the, the big the big problem. G beta has to be dense in C0. And this is a, a major problem for us. <clears throat> how, how we solve that? Well, we take a detour for that. So once you have, uh, um, <clears throat> Once you have an operator that satisfies the maximum principle and it's continuous in C0, et cetera, you can, you can associate a resolvent as we did in, at the beginning of the talk. We, can, we cannot prove it, uh, directly that uh, the image of C0 is dense. So we took a detour, a large detour, passing by supermedian functions. And uh, we prove actually that the supermedian functions are dense. And to do that, uh, you just notice that the image of, of Borel functions are always supermedian. So you, you can extend this to uh, Borel functions. So G, G beta is a good operator 
on the Borel functions. Uh, and this is a nice Banach space. And so the only thing you have to prove is that the supermedian separate points, because it is general result that supermedians are uh, is a lattice. <clears throat> so, and that, that can be done because this uh, singularity that has this uh, green kernel to power beta. You don't need a, a specific uh, control on the singularity. It's enough to have a singularity on the diagonal. And so the image of a function like uh, the indicator of a small ball around X will be very high at X and very low at, at, at Y if epsilon is a small. So this, uh, this function separate points and then the supermedians are dense. And there is a generalization of concern that says that whenever you have that, you, you don't have the density of uh, the image of zero, but you have the density of the supermedians, then you have a semigroup. In the same way, you, you prove that the resolvent is uh, with the Laplace transform of something, that something is a semigroup, everything goes okay, except, except that the semigroup is not continuous, not necessarily continuous. And where, what is the problem? The problem is that there are some points on your space where the Markov process at time zero decides to split on the space. So P zero is not the, the direct measure of the X. So the first thing is it splits in the space and then it runs like a normal Markov process. And there are weird things happens in, for these ray semigroups. At every time, so you have a Cadillac Markov process, perfectly defined, et cetera. At every time, XT never visits this set of branching process, never. But on the left of some points, of some random points, the process enters into this set. The set N is small <coughs> in general. <coughs> enters into this set and branches again. And this prevents the semigroup to be continued. So in order to prove that it's a feather semigroup, you have to prove that N is empty. Not that it's small. You can have only one point actually. So you need to prove that N is empty. And there, this is a very, the most technical part of, of our proof. Then uh, it is really, really the, the singularity at the, at the diagonal that plays a fundamental role. So once you have proof that, this, uh, that N is empty, then is over uh, um, the same with the feller, and then and then you prove that G is a potential of a feller process. <clears throat> That's for bounded open sets. What about R D or unbounded? Well, in that case, <clears throat> we cannot use Z zero. We need to have a control on the functions we are going to use. So at least they have to interval near infinity. And you modify a little bit the, the, the potential. You just multiply by a fixed test function that makes integrability property. And so the, this potential is the potential of a, of a process and it has this shape. So here I, I remove this. So, so essentially you prove that the potential has this form with the function C that is fixed. So the function C is one for a long time and the case fast enough at infinity to make it integrable. And so you have to remove this function C and the way you remove it is by a time change. So finally at the end, the unbounded case is obtained by a time change. Uh, only uh, uh, one or 30 seconds about D equal two. In D equal two, the green function of a Greenian Urban set has a singularity like this one over pi log x minus y. Okay. <clears throat> so it should be negative. So have a logarithmic uh, singularity. This is much better than, than the dimension three or more because then any power is a green function. So the restriction on the power is because integrability. And here you have any power is defines a good potential, even exponentials. 
So even we can have alpha g data. It's a green function. Not for all alpha. Alpha, well, because integrability reasons, alpha, alpha has to be between zero and two pi. So in two dimensions, you, you have powers of logarithmic that are green functions, and you have even exponential of, 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 of this green function is like one over the norm of x minus y. So in, in two dimensions, you have uh, green functions of this type also. And that, uh, according to my, to my good friend Abelio, will have, should have imp implications on Gaussian field freeze, uh, Gaussian field, uh, free fields, sorry. <clears throat> so that's it. Thanks a lot. A little, uh, a little remembrance of Maradona. <clears throat> Thank you, Jaime. Let's thank uh, Jaime, please. Uh, beautiful picture, Jaime. Yeah, beautiful talk. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I knew that, Pablo. <clears throat> um, so is there any question or 